So let's not waste any time and get into the anatomy of a drone. Yeah, so this is where it's going to start getting fun with me clicking around and, move, and using all my uh, technology here. Okay, so, <coughs> excuse me. Like we were talking about earlier, it's not really a drone. Okay, a drone is a, actually by definition is something that has to be piloted. It has no intel on its own, it has to be piloted. Okay, an unmanned aerial system is a smart system. Okay, comprised of more than one part. Obviously, we have the vehicle side or the aircraft side, and we have the ground control station side. So even with a Phantom 4 and your controller, you're basically a UAS system. Okay, because you have the capability with your tablet or whatever you're using to file a flight plan and do all that cool stuff, just like the big military drones you see here. One thing, I'm going to do my first crazy uh, web link here. Oh, it actually worked this time. Okay, this is one of the first sites I'd like to point out for a very good reason. You'll see this is probably one of the most comprehensive glossary of terms that I've found on the internet for all things drone. Okay, we're going to be throwing out acronyms today. It's like a new language. You got to understand what the difference between OSD is, SDK. You got FPV. You know, there's a million acronyms, and this is a great resource for you to be able to go to and see, you know, hey, what does this mean? Okay, so that's kind of my first link there. And let's see if I can actually exit out of it. Oh yeah, that actually worked. Cool. Okay, so drone types. We're not going to get deep in the weeds. There, there's people out there that want to have like four or five different categories of drones. Keep it simple. To me, it's really it comes down to fixed wing or multi rotor. You can insert the term VTOL or whatever you want, but it's fixed wing multi rotor. We're going to keep it simple. Obviously, the fixed wing side is a huge advantage there. It's going to be flight time, typically, or an area coverage. Okay. Here in Minnesota, we actually have a company called Sentara that produces these agricultural drones and uh, these fixed wings. And that's basically what they're designed for is to cover a large uh, acreage in the shortest amount of time. Typically very expensive. Okay. Not the ones we're typically going to get into our schools and play with on our own personally. So multi-rotors is where we're going to focus today, obviously. And when you, when you talk about multi-rotors, almost all of the, the uh, drones you see are quadcopters. You know, they have the four propellers, and you'll see right there, drone quad rotor X. That is our most common configuration. Okay, almost all of your commercial drones available are the quadcopter X. Later on this afternoon, we are going to show you a hexarotor B there, a big heavy lift drone that we have, M600 that we use for LiDAR imaging. We're going to run through a pre-flight checklist on that. Okay. But all different types of configurations are available. And if you get into building, sometimes you can actually find build kits that will kind of push you in one direction or another. Obviously, the only reason I'm going to have six or even eight motors is when I'm trying to lift more weight. Okay. So your average Phantom and Mavic or Pro, and even our little STEM guys today, they're all quad copper X. So that's kind of what we're going to focus on. And real quick on flight physics, I'm going to point you to a great free resource here. And this is the company I was talking about earlier, uh, Parallax. They discontinued making the drones, but the great thing about them is they left all their curriculum that they had on, on this uh, quadcopter. It's free. They, they told me they're going to just leave it there forever, basically. So this is always going to be a great resource. Uh, and you can see right here, safety, UAV safety, physics of flight, the assembly, which obviously you can't do unless you have the drone, but how to fly and they even had projects that you could add on to your drone, which we can't do anymore. But these, just these free resources right here, and this is pretty much where I got some of these pictures, especially the top one there. Okay, but flight physics, just like an airplane, drones have the three axes of flight, pitch, roll, yaw, 
XYZ, whatever, however you want to call it. And how that relates to a drone is you can see on the left there, the key to it all is the motor spin. So I have to have opposing motor forces in pairs. And you'll notice my one and my four are clockwise and my two and my three are counterclockwise. Okay. That is the key to the flight physics on a drone. Okay. So for instance, if my drone's in hover and I want it to move forward, I'm obviously going to spin up my motors three and four a little bit faster to where my drone dips, and now it should push forward. Okay. If I want to roll it, I'm going to probably spin up my left motors, roll it to the right, my right motors, roll it to the left. Same thing as an airplane, it's just being done with four motors instead of uh, flight surfaces. Okay. How that relates to our controls, Okay, you'll see on the far right there, the classic uh, control transmitter. Okay, and you'll notice the red arrows. Typically, most people will use the left for our thrust and our yaw. And there's a reason for that, because most of these transmitters, you can push that, butt, that uh, handle all the way down and it'll stay. Okay. Typically on these transmitters, the one on the right is spring loaded and it will always want to go back to center when you let go. Which is I, which is why I think I prefer that a person would not use ever use the right hand stick as the thrust. That's my personal opinion, because it's always going to spring load back to the center position. With that said, almost all of these transmitters do have the option for you to switch which stick does what. But like I said, for safety purposes, I would always keep my thrust and my yaw on my left stick and my pitch and my roll on the right stick. That's just me. And you'll see right in the middle there, if, if I'm using a cell phone or a tablet or something, I can still have the same controls with the virtual control sticks there. I find those kind of hard to fly like that with my thumbs on the, the screen, but I've seen lots of kids especially that definitely prefer that over the actual controller. So it's kind of a mixed bag. Okay, so let's get down to what makes a drone tick. So right off the bat, I'm going to say this is an FPV, FPV drone, which stands for first person view. So this is like a racing drone. Some of you may have heard of the drone racing league. This has become quite big. It's actually televised. It's on ESPN. I mean, this is the big time. And to me, these guys are kind of the last of the old school piecing drones together type people. And they're like, to me, like NASCAR. They're, they're constantly, they have a parameter and they're constantly tweaking and trying to get every micro amp out of their drone that they can, performance wise, all that. So to me, this was a good picture to use for what's kind of been common to all drones because they're not all created equal. Right off the bat, you're gonna notice we're not, we're missing GPS because you don't need GPS on a racing drone, okay, but GPS is definitely needed if you're going to go map out a field and have it fly autonomously, you need that GPS uh, so it can uh, plot waypoints and stuff. We're, we're going to kind of focus on the common hardware and stuff. Uh, we're going to talk about the flight control sensors. And it's kind of hard to see on all this picture. We're going to kind of break it out a little bit and we'll talk about the motors, the ESCs or the electronic signal controllers, props, batteries, the frames themselves, uh, the control receivers, and the transmitters. Okay, so this is kind of a busy slide, and what's interesting to me is that, that uh, picture on the left, the evolution of flight controllers, if you can see, starting at the top left, the size, what's happened over the years, how they're being shrunk, same thing with the CPU down below it, everything's shrinking down, and then finally at the bottom, you're kind of seeing those combined. And even that very one at the very bottom far right, that, that as of probably 2014, that was a pretty high tech uh, flight board. That's kind of out of date now. And I can show you an interesting picture of that real quick. Test out my dot cam here. Let's see if we, okay, so this is a, uh, a taken apart parrot mini drone. Okay, so we just looked at the old concept of having separate boards between your flight controller and your autopilot and your CPU. Now what you're seeing is with this tiny little drone is 
all of these components are on a one board, a two-sided board now. Okay, so this is how crazy this stuff is getting. So it's getting to the point where it's not really a, an area where you can build something like this, not to this detail. Okay, but yeah, everything is shrinking and getting smaller and it's definitely different than when we first started. Back to our show here. There we go. Okay, let's point out some of the sensors on your board here. Okay, these are common sensors to all drones. Biggest thing you gotta have is a microcontroller, which is that big chip on the upper part of the board there. And this is a pretty old flight board, obviously. Uh, we'll point out, oh, I forgot I have a laser pointer. Okay. You'll notice my magnetometer. Laser pointers, they can't see that. Oh, uh, use your player on your mouse. Oh, yeah, duh. Sorry. Okay, so you'll see over here we have an altimeter or a barometric sensor. Okay, so all drones have to have some type of way of determining what's that? Your mouse on top screen. Oh. I got my buddy back here, Zach back here helping me out because I'm not noticing where my uh, mouse is going here. Okay, so start this over. So here's my microcontroller. Uh, microcontroller, this is kind of the key to all the inputs to your motors and how they're going to spin and when they're going to spin and how fast they're going to spin. And it integrates all my sensor inputs. And some of our sensors, the main sensors that are going to be on all drones is an altimeter or a barometer. This is, we have to have a way to have an altitude measurement. These are pretty rough usually. They're not super uh, specific, but some of your higher end drones, even the little guys we're going to talk about later, actually have range finders, what they call range finders, or some people call them ultrasonic sensors. Great, they make it way more accurate. The problem is they're only good for low altitudes, like the one we're going to look at will only help you about up to 12 or 13 feet. And after that, you're pretty much on the altitude sensor. The magnetometer, okay. this guy right here, and this is, like I said, a really old card. You'll notice the magnetometer, and that's used to help us get a uh, magnetic reference point to magnetic north. And that works hand in hand with my uh, accelerators, accelerometers and my gyros. And you'll see right here, these are all contained you typically within what we call an IMU, an inertial measurement unit. And actually the magnetometer is usually within that also. Okay, so in your newer drones, all that's gonna be in one little chip. Okay, this is the same technology that's been around for years and years in the military and even in your cell phones, frankly. Same technology. Uh, the old ICBM missiles, this was their main guidance system back in the day. So basically it's a little processor that computes all these uh, three axis uh, accelerometers and gyro inputs. And as long as it knows its starting position, it can always know where it's going based on the inputs from all these sensors, okay? And it's actually what's gonna make our uh, STEM drones we talk about later able to be autonomous, okay? Because they do not have GPS, okay? So, but they can be programmed to fly a set uh, pattern based on these sensor inputs, okay? So it's pretty neat. And I've got a quick little uh, video we're gonna look at, because I could talk to you about these uh, IMU technology, but. This video really does a great job of explaining it much better than I could. Hello, Dan Nedelkowski here from howtomechatronics.com. In this tutorial, we will learn how the MEMS accelerometer, gyroscope and magnetometer work and how to use them with the Arduino board. Also, with the processing development environment, we will make some practical applications using the sensors. First, let's briefly explain how each of these microelectromechanical systems or MEMS sensor work. We will start with the accelerometer. It measures acceleration by measuring change in capacitance. Its microstructure looks something like this. It has a mass attached to a spring, which is confined to move along one direction and fixed outer plates. So when an acceleration in the particular direction will be applied, the mass will move and the capacitance between the plates and the mass will change. This change in capacitance will be measured, processed and it will correspond to a particular acceleration value. 
Next is the gyroscope, which measures angular rate using the Coriolis effect when a mass is moving in a particular direction with a particular velocity and when an external angular rate will be applied as shown with the green arrow, a force will occur as shown with the blue arrow which will cause perpendicular displacement of the mass. So, similar to the accelerometer, this displacement will cause change in capacitance which will be measured, processed and it will correspond to a particular angular rate. The microstructure of the gyroscope looks something like this a mass that is constantly moving or oscillating and when an external angular rate will be applied, a flexible part of the mass would move and make the perpendicular displacement. Ok, now let's explain how the magnetometer works. It measures the earth magnetic field by using Hall effect or magnetoresistive effect. Actually, almost 90% of the sensors on the market use the Hall effect and here's how it works. If we have a conductive plate like this and we set current to flow through it, the electrons would flow straight from one to the other side of the plate. Now if we bring some magnetic field near the plate, we would disturb the straight flow and the electrons would deflect to one side of the plate and the positive poles to the other side of the plate. This means that if we put a meter now between these two sides, we will get some voltage which depends from the magnetic field strength and its direction. The other 10% of the sensors on the market use the magnetoresistive effect. These sensors use materials that are sensitive to magnetic field, usually composed of iron and nickel. So when these materials are exposed to magnetic field, they change their resistance. Ok, now let's connect these sensors to the Arduino board and make some use of them. As an example, I will use the GY80 breakout board, which has the following sensors. ADXL 345 3-axis accelerometer, L3G4 200D 3-axis gyroscope, MC588 3L 3-axis magnetometer and also a barometer and a thermometer which we won't use in this tutorial. First, let's hook up the board to the Arduino. This board uses the I2C communication protocol which means that we can use all the sensors with just two wires. So, in order to make the communication between the you can check my I2C communication tutorial. Ok, now let's see the codes for... Alright, so kind of the main focus of that was just the MEM sensors there, how they actually work. So they actually miniaturize electromechanical sensors. and This is what's allowing all this uh, awesome technology. And interestingly, we're starting to see the drone technology start to go back up to the airplanes now. So you look at some of your new airplanes coming out, like the 787 or the new Airbuses. They're starting to miniaturize their stuff now, just like the drones do, and get more redundancy and save weight and all that kind of good stuff. A uh, couple of good links here. I'm not going to go to them, but for more detailed explanations on sensors, there's a couple of great links right there that you see on the slides. And like I said, they'll be included when we uh, send this package to you. Okay, so next let's talk about the power system, how this thing is going to actually operate motors and electronic signal controllers or ESCs. Uh, real quick, I'll point out on the left there, you see a two wire. These are the smaller motors you typically see on like the stem drones we're going to talk about today, have the small two wire motors. In the middle there, you see the three wire motors. Okay, real quick as a reference, if I see a two wire motor, that means it can only span one way. So I definitely, you'll notice those wires are color coded. So if I was going to put those on a drone, I'd have to know which motor is going in which spot to make it spin the correct way. The three wire motors are universal. They can spin either way. That's going to depend on how those three wires are hooked up. Okay. In the old drone building class, a lot of ways, a lot of times you have no way to know which way your motor is going to spin. So that's part of your process of building is doing a motor spin test because you don't really know. They say it's spinning the wrong way and I want it spinning the other way. The great thing about these is I just pick any two leads, I swap them around and it will reverse the spins. So that that's, was definitely a part of our build, having to do that. And right below those uh, motors in the middle, you'll see kind of the older, old school electronic signal controllers. And another way to think about that is I call them translators. Okay, because the motor is what I call a dumb device. It's it only understands voltage. It wants voltage so it can spin. Okay. It can't talk to a computer. 
So that electronic signal controller, that's the whole purpose of that guy is to, it's got chips on it, so it can actually talk back to the flight controller, but also convert those inputs into an analog output that the motor can understand and actually use. Okay. On the right there, you'll see how we've kind of come progressed as far as electronic signal controllers. Typically, when we first started, you always had a separate ESC for each motor. Now, almost all your big drones, I would guess about all of them, or have gone to the common one, uh, four and one ESC concept. Obviously, when it comes, our number one enemy, when it comes to drones, is flight time. Okay. Battery power. Uh, so anything you can do to reduce that, they're gonna do. And that's what we've kind of seen that evolution between batteries getting better and the electronics getting better. We're getting more and more flight time as we go. So that's a big part of that. And I do have to hit you with one more little video, but this is a good one. This one will kind of explain, because those motors that we're talking about, those three wires, those are what we call brushless motors. And this video is going to kind of show you how those and the ESCs work together. Hello, Dan here from howtomakeatronics.com. In this tutorial, we will learn how brushless motors and ESCs work and how to control them using Arduino. We will start with explaining the working principle of a brushless DC motor. A built DC motor consists of two main parts, a stator and a rotor. For this illustration, the rotor is a permanent magnet with two poles, while the stator consists of coils arranged as thrown. We all know that if we apply current through a coil, it will generate a magnetic field and the magnetic field lines or the poles depend on the current direction. So if we apply the appropriate current, the coil will generate a magnetic field that will attract the rotor's permanent magnet. Now if we activate each coil one after another, the rotor will keep rotating because of the force interaction between the permanent and the electromagnet. In order to increase the efficiency of the motor, we can wind two opposite coils as a single coil in a way that they will generate opposite poles to the rotor's poles, thus we will get double the attraction force. With this configuration, we can generate the six poles on the stator with just three coils or phases. We can further increase the efficiency by energizing two coils at the same time. In that way, one coil will attract and the other coil will repel the rotor. In order the rotor to make full 360 degree cycle, it needs 6 steps or intervals. If we take a look at the current waveform, we can notice that in each interval there is one phase with positive current, one phase with negative current and the third phase is turned off. This gives us the idea that we can connect the free endpoints of each of the three phases together and so we can share the current between them or use a single current to energize two phases at the same time. Here's an example. If we pull up phase A high or connect it to the positive DC voltage with some kind of a switch, for example a MOSFET, and on the other side connect the phase B to ground, then the current will flow from VCC through phase A, the neutral point and phase B to ground. So with just a single current flow, we generated the four different poles which caused the motor to move. With this configuration, we actually have a star connection of the motor phases, where the neutral point is internally connected and the other three ends of the phases come out of the motor. And that's why BLDC motors have three wires coming out of them. So, in order the rotor to make full cycle, we just need to activate the correct two MOSFETs in each of the six intervals. And that's what ESCs are actually all about. An ESC or an electronic speed controller controls the brushless motor movement or speed by activating the appropriate MOSFETs to create the rotating magnetic field so that the motor rotates. The higher the frequency or the quicker the ESC goes through the six intervals, the higher the speed of the motor will be. However, here comes an important question and that's how do we know when to activate which phase? The answer is that we need to know the position of the rotor and there are two common methods used for determining the rotor position. The first common method is by using Hall FX sensors embedded in the stator arranged equally 120 or 60 degrees from each other. As the rotor's permanent magnets rotate, the Hall FX sensors sense the magnetic field and generate a logic high for one magnetic pole or a logic low for the opposite pole. 
According to this information, the ESC knows when to activate the next commutation sequence or interval. The second commod method used for determining the rotor position is through sensing the back electromotive force or back EMF. The back EMF occurs as a result of the exact opposite process of generating a magnetic field or when a moving or changing magnetic field passes through a coil, it induces a current in the coil. So when the moving magnetic field of the rotor passes through the free coil or the one that's not active, it will induce a current flow in the coil and as a result a voltage drop will occur in that coil. The ESC captures these voltage drops as they occur and based on them it predicts or calculates when the next interval should take place. Alright, so that's, that's basically how your uh, ESCs and your motors work together. Uh, like I said, that one in the middle, that's kind of the old, old school mentality. Uh, definitely we would see a lot of those ESCs burn out with our experience in the build. Uh, that was probably our most common component that would go out and just getting, because they deal with a lot of current, which we'll kind of talk about a little bit when we get into the batteries. But uh, let's talk about props for a second. Okay, you can spend some of these drones you get now, like the Mavic Pro, that's going for like 2,000, 1,500 now. You're spending a good amount of money on some of these drones, and uh, your props are like $20, 20 to $30 maybe. And these things are going to be able to crash your $2,000 drone if they're not looked after. So to me, props are very, very important, just like a real airplane. You have to look at your props. And, Later on this afternoon, we're going to be doing some inspections, and we'll, that's one of the key parts, is any nicks, any cracks especially, any pieces missing, you don't want to use those props anymore. You really don't, because you're asking for disaster. When you're depending on, it's not like an airplane, and just because I have four engines doesn't mean it's going to stay in the air if I lose one. <laughs> if I lose a prop in flight, the thing's coming down. That's all there is to it, and that's based on those flight physics we talked about. Uh, but on the bottom left there, you'll see some common the three-bladed props. Those are kind of common on those indoor, little indoor uh, FPV drones, some of the small acrobatic ones, they'll use those little three-bladed props. Uh, our stem drones and most of your bigger drones use the uh, two-bladed props. Notice I got that picture there again with the clockwise and the counterclockwise. Okay. It's very important because props actually only spin one way or they're only meant to spin one way based on their uh, aerodynamic design, just like a propeller on an airplane. And most kits, like if I'm building a drone, even on our STEM drones, they'll typically color them white or black, or they'll make a dip, they'll put a little L on them or a little R on them to show which way they're supposed to spin. I don't like all that because there are errors. We, we ran into it in our build shop. We get a pair of right props, we give them to the kids, they put them on in the right spot. We find out they're really left props and they were mismarked. So to me, the key to props is, hopefully you can see this. I think that's a pretty good picture on the right. Oh, sorry. Hopefully on the, you can see this. You'll notice all these props have a high side and a low side. Okay, so here, obviously, this low side is pretty much on the, the table and the high side is sitting above. So this high side and that high side. So this is telling me the high side should always be the direction it's been. Okay, so this is definitely a clockwise prop. Okay, so with this prop, I would definitely put this in position one or three. Okay, or one and four, I'm sorry, I can't see it far. Uh, then obviously my opposite props for two and three would be my high side and my low sides would be switched here. Okay, a common symptom if you ever, because you are going to crash your drones, especially these small ones we're talking about, the little props like to fly off on crashes, depending on how bad they are, and you go to stick them back on, you're in a hurry, you go to take off, your drone's gonna wanna flip. And that's your classic symptom of the props being on wrong. Okay, as soon as it, as soon as it tries to lift off, it's gonna flip one way or the other, and that's just immediately telling you you have your props on wrong. So that's kind of a good rule of thumb. Just remember the high side versus the low side, and the high side is always the direction of spin. Hey, so batteries, okay, batteries, batteries. Okay, we've all heard the stories. 
not as many now as there used to be when we first started back in 2013. You heard about, you know, the, the Samsung phones, you heard about the 787 aircraft even had some fires based on their uh, lithium batteries. Okay. They are a, typically a more dangerous type battery, but they've gotten way better and way safer uh, than how they used to be. In fact, if you look at the this batteries on the left and the, these batteries and this one over here, most people are not going to even play with these types of batteries anymore. Unless you're doing an actual build kit, it's a mid-sized drone, you might buy some of these batteries. Or if you're FPD racing, you might have these kind of batteries still. And we still have some for our build kits. These are probably the more dangerous of all the lithium batteries that you're going to play with in RC, in the RC world. But uh, one of my pet peeves, and we were guilty of this for the longest time ourselves, so it's, we, we were really bad about this when we first started. You'll notice this battery right here on the left, nice and square. <laughs> this one here on the right is bulging or it's getting round. Okay. When a battery gets like that, this type of battery, you should not be using that battery anymore. You should be getting rid of that battery because that's not a safe battery at all anymore. Okay. Like I said, we were guilty of it. We never thankfully had any issues, okay. but we could have. And best practices, it's not the, the smartest thing to do is to use those type of batteries. I understand the reason because these batteries typically are very expensive. I think the ones we were using were like 50 bucks a piece. Obviously, that you don't want to have to get rid of those too often. Okay, on the bottom right here, you're gonna notice uh, this is kind of a very common industry type bag that you will use with these types of batteries. And best practices to me is when you're using the chargers for these batteries, for one thing, they should be what's known as a balanced charger. In fact, you should be using only the charger that is recommended for that battery. Okay. Always follow the manufacturer's directions. And it's hard to see. You can, in fact, you can't see it very well at all. You have your normal power connector here. Okay. Up in here, you can't really see it. There's typically a little data connector that plugs into the battery charger. And that's so that the charger itself can balance out the cell charges. Because you don't want to charge one cell than the other. You want it to be a balanced charge. And looking at this batteries, uh, basically these are uh, depending on how many cells you have, they're all in series, that's going to determine your voltage. Uh, your nominal cell voltage for almost all of these batteries is 3.7 volts per cell. You'll notice right off the bat, this battery has four cells. So four times 3.7, that's how they end up getting their 14.8 volts. Okay. Not to get crazy deep into this stuff, but when you're matching up a quadcopter for the battery power you need, uh, voltage is going to determine how fast your, your motors are going to be able to spin. General rule of thumb is my mid-size, like phantom size, are going to have bigger paddles or bigger props and have to spin less RPMs. My smaller drones with the small props are going to have to spin at a lot faster rate to get the same uh, lift and acrobatics out of it. Uh, as far as capacity, that's always our drawback, our biggest hindrance. Okay, so these are rated by amp hours. Most of these, uh, unlike our car, our car batteries are rated for amp hours. These are milliamp hours. Essentially, 5,000 milliamps is really saying five amp hours. Okay. Meaning this battery can produce five amps in one hour. Okay. We won't go deep into it because here's kind of where we're at nowadays. Almost all of your, any drone you buy, any commercial drone phantoms, even our little stem drones are going to have these uh, smart batteries now. Okay. These are not necessarily smart batteries, but they're very safe batteries. They come with their own charger. They, you know, these are very safe little batteries. Uh, some general safety things in general. Uh, you should never charge batteries and just leave them. Okay. We, we've all done it accidentally, and it's pretty forgiving on these little chargers. Okay. But the chargers that go with these and these types of batteries, that can end in disaster. Okay, so you should never leave uh, batteries charging overnight. You should always unplug them, store them safely before you walk out for the end of the day. And if I'm in a school environment, depending on the age level of my kids, I'm probably not going to want all the kids messing with the charging stuff and doing this and that. 
probably going to want one person or the teacher themselves actually controlling the batteries. And a great system that we use and a lot of people use is to have the, the good tub and the bad tub. Okay, so you keep all your charged good batteries in one tub and as they use them and they throw them into the bad tub and then you keep circulating them that way. Because batteries are always our limiting factor when it comes to having fun with drones. So obviously when you have a drone, you want more than one battery, as many as you can get actually. But here you'll see, and we won't go into this, but there is a really good uh, battery site there. A lot of good information on uh, battery safety and stuff. And just to me, just common sense, follow directions. Don't leave them unattended. Be safe with your batteries. Okay, frames. This gets crazy here. Yeah, you can see on the far left there, somebody literally took a, some wood and mounted some motors to it. And this is obviously a person that's deep into the hobby here. And you got to be careful here because before you try to do something like this, in my opinion, you should get a pre-designed or a pre-built kit that you put together where all the parts will be matched. Because just because I make a frame doesn't mean it's balanced out correctly. Like if that one in the middle, for instance, if if one of the legs is a little bit longer than the others, that's going to throw off your flight dynamics. Okay, so but these are great projects for kids, especially especially if you're on a low budget. You can order the components online. You can match them up, and I'll show you some uh, great resources on that. And finally, on the bottom right there, 3D printing. It's kind of amazing what you can print. 3D wise, I mean, you can print whole frames and spire frames. You can print the tello frame, which we're going to actually talk about later, and a lot of the pieces. You can actually even print some of the props. All just depends on what people have uploaded out there. And, there, and definitely, both drones we're going to talk about, you can uh, print out the uh, prop guards, which we'll talk about. I should have talked about that the props, actually. Most drones, the bigger ones, do not necessarily have prop guards. Cause you're not using them in the way that we're using the smaller indoor drones, but all of your uh, toy drones or your small micro drones typically have prop guards. And you always want to put those on, not just for safety, but as you'll find out when you're flying these little guys around, you're going to bounce off walls here and there. And it really saves you from uh, a lot of crashes and saves your props. But frames, I got a, another cool site here that I'm going to point out. This is for all my educators, K through 12. This is a very low cost uh, group of people who put this stuff together. It's only about $100 a year to belong to this. And you get, here's some just of their free stuff, but you can actually, once you pay that fee, your annual membership fee, it opens up a whole bunch of curriculum and many different projects for every grade level, as you can see. I mean, stuff from uh, foam gliders to balsa wood to drone stuff. Not everything is drone related in here. It's all about flight. So there's a lot of airplane stuff in here too. And it's just, and what I like about this, this uh, source here is it's all designed to be low cost. So all of their kits, all of the projects that they have you do are common materials that are easy to get. And you can have whole workshops on that stuff and they will actually help you out with that i think they will actually oh wrong thing here's some of the basic free lessons they have okay so you can actually get a micro quad for free not get the quad for free but uh, the lesson on how to make one and like i said once you open up the uh membership and actually <coughs> get one, you are, they open up the whole uh, site to you. Okay. I cannot emphasize this is an awesome resource, especially if you're cash strapped, which most of us are nowadays. Very cheap, one of the cheapest ways to get into at least aerospace type thought processes and little projects that can be done fairly cheaply. Okay. Okay, last part of that uh, thing that we are, uh, common drone parts we typically have to have a transmitter and a receiver a flight controller we have a flight control board but we have to have a way to control it manually from where we're sitting so you see on our left there our transmitter our radio transmitter and 
to use that transmitter, we have to have a radio receiver that typically sits on the flight board itself, or it sits close to the flight board and attaches to the flight board. Okay. Because each of those uh, stick inputs to get my pitch, my roll, my thrust, all that has to be on a separate channel tied directly into my flight board. Okay. Kind of the key to all of this is the protocols. Okay. Basically, all that saying is my transmitter on the left there needs to speak the same language as my radio receiver on the right. Okay. And that's typically a no-brainer. Like, for instance, if I buy a spectrum transmitter, it's going to come with its own receiver. Okay. So that's typically not a big deal. Uh, you just don't want to try to mix and match. So it's kind of like doing Apple versus PC. It's not going to work. So. But it's usually not a problem. And this, we're, again, we're talking about people building from the ground up their own system. Okay. So many of you may not do this, but this is just kind of the, some of the basics of it. As far as a word you might hear a lot is telemetry. Okay. So right now, a lot of drones are just designed where I can do my transmitter inputs and my flight card is going to receive those and act, the drone's going to act accordingly. But if I want the drone to actually send the stuff back to me, either on a cell phone or some type of laptop device, I need what's known as telemetry. Basically, that radio receiver also has to be able to transmit data back. And that's, that's all that is saying. Uh, binding, even on your commercial drones, it's fairly seamless. But on your old school drones that you're building yourself, there's typically a binding process, and that's Basically, that's a universal transmitter, meaning I could bind with a bunch of different drones, but I need to match up to the specific drone I want to fly. So there's typically some type of binding process where I link up to that particular drone. And we'll even see that with our STEM drones. As soon as you turn either the Talawan or the Paramambo, you have to uh, recognize it either with your uh, device or your uh, transmitter to uh, make sure they pair up so that I can go ahead and fly. And this site right here is a really great site to goes way more in depth about the frequencies and stuff. Pretty much nowadays, almost everybody's going to 2.4 gigahertz. Okay. There's many other frequencies available, especially when you get into FPV, they tend to use lower frequencies because they have, the big problem with FPV is uh, that video transmission. Okay, so, and there's a lag time behind that, so they're always trying to find ways to make that better. Hey, okay, so looks like I went pretty fast on this one, so definitely a lot of time for questions. So if you have any questions, uh, you can either type them in the chat or uh, there is a raise hand function. Would you think we have a small enough group in this meeting to just let them go in? I think so. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you can unmute and yeah. ask your question, absolutely. Yeah, that's always the best way, I think. I'll give a minute if you don't see any questions, and we'll just record it. No questions. No, there we go. Uh, on the college level, have you integrated this into a credited class? Integrated uh, what? Pete, you want to go ahead and unmute and yeah. uh, maybe get a little deeper in your question there? Sure. Hi, good afternoon. Thanks uh, for doing this. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. Yes, we got you. Okay. Uh, basically, I oversee the engineering, science, and technology program uh, on Long Island. Uh, very heavily congested airspace, but uh, the drone technology has been coming in in a number of areas. One is uh, putting a um, massive wind farm off of the Long Island, and they're talking about using drone technology for inspection and, and observing what's going on. Um, in terms of securing an airport area, of putting up a drone shield that monitors ingoing and outgoing traffic. Um, our traffic pattern and so forth. There's many different areas that are starting to bubble up. So we're trying to look at how to integrate the drone technology into our program to do two things. One is 
amplify uh, the expertise and skills in drone technology. But the other is also it, it has all the technology that one would ever want in uh, skills base for technicians today. The communications, the electronics, the aeronautics, uh, it's a multidiscipline of skills in understanding how these work. So we're trying to integrate this into our two year degree program and trying to ramp up that process. We're trying to see how this, how to go about that process. How do we infuse this into our program? Have you had any experience or uh, with that? Absolutely, Pete. So uh, this, this is Zach Nicklin. I'm, I'm the U.S. program manager here at Northland. Um, again, in fact, I'm going to, you'll, you'll give me my 10 feet, Tom. I'll come in front of the camera here. <laughs> um, so absolutely, we, we've uh, been integrating these programs uh, into our curriculum here, and, and we did it uh, three ways, actually, with small UAS. Uh, the first is doing a bolt-on certificate. Um, we go into regulations, the part 107 of the ground school stuff that you need for that exam. Uh, and then further we go into some remote sensing and some processing uh, because we also have an imagery analyst and a geospatial intelligence program uh, that we pull classes from. So wherever possible, uh, we pull the existing classes into the into the curriculum um, so we don't have to reinvent the wheel. I mean, obviously we had to make a ground school for, for part 107 as that was a, a new thing that came out. Uh, so we, we made the short certificate and it's basically a bolt on to other programs. Uh, so, for instance, here at Northland, we've got fire technology, we've got law enforcement, uh, we've got a few different programs that it's absolutely an enhancement for the students to have additional qualifications. And seeing as how drones are being integrated into these industries, um, you know, very fast actually, um, getting folks straight from the schoolhouse uh, out into the field that already have these credentials and already have the understanding of how they utilize drones in, within their specific field uh, has been very valuable for students. Uh, so that's one of the ways we've done it as a bolt-on certificate program. As we start getting deeper into the technician side, we've got both a diploma and an AAS degree. And the way we built this, we actually built it as a stackable credential. So the standalone uh, bolt or the, the bolt-on cert certificate is actually the first part of the diploma, which is a two-semester program. Um, and, and then that follows as the first year of our AAS degree. Um, as we progress to, to higher levels from the certificate to the diploma to the associate's degree, um, we've been adding in uh, a lot more technology. So we've actually got electronically, an electronic technology automated systems program here. So we pulled in microcontrollers and sensor technology, uh, some of the programming behind it uh, as a part of this AAS degree. So it can actually be done, it be done in multiple ways, and it really depends on what you're looking to get out for, of it. Um, if you have a digital media program, if you've got a videography or photography program, um, you know, pulling in some of the basics on, you know, how the SLR cameras work, what are the basics of photography, the basics of videography, uh, bringing that stuff in is important. Uh, if you've got an agriculture program, uh, we've got a precision ag equipment tech program here that really focuses on, on precision agriculture and, and the new technologies that are being used out there in the farming industry. Well, that bolt-on certificate, again, works great uh, within that one. So um, so I guess the, the short answer is yes, it can be done. Um, it, it does take some some thinking and planning on, on your part uh, based on, on what you have available for your resources, not only monetary resources to, to actually go out and buy the equipment that you need, uh, but also resources as in existing courseware, whether or not you've got to um, you know, fully make your own courses or if you can uh, pick and choose things that make sense based on current offerings that you have. Did that kind of answer your question? Yes, it does. Thanks. All right, great. I think we have a couple more questions here on the chat. Uh, somebody asked about DJI uh, FPV goggles. Um, frankly, I haven't used them, so I don't really have an opinion on them. Uh, I don't fly FPV very often. Right. Uh, most of what I do is, is more based around uh, inspection, um, multispectral imaging, thermal imaging, uh, using LIDAR, uh, light detecting and ranging, so I, I don't really spend a lot of time on, on FPV systems, although I'd love to have more time to do it, and it's just not here for me. Yeah, we've, um, we've played with it on a little bit of indoor drone racing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Every once in a while, I'll throw on my goggles and race through the halls just to get students interested in things like that, um, you know, as long as they're not, uh, you know, the, the halls aren't busy or anything like that. Right. 
Um, but yeah, I just don't spend much time with FPV personally. All right, uh, next question we got. Uh, Chris was wondering about the drone pilot's license and if any students become licensed drone operators. Absolutely, the next section we'll actually talk about is some basics on, on 107 recreational flying and the educational exemption in the 2018 FAA Modernization and Reform Act. Um, so we'll go into that a little bit more, but students have to be at least 16 years old to be licensed. You can take the test, I believe, when you're 14, uh, but you have to be 16 to be licensed. And uh, we absolutely uh, run events. I know educators that are out there working in, uh, in the high schools uh, that are offering classes uh, for the Part 107 exam. And uh, so there's, there's plenty of people that are out there doing it. And that's definitely one of the certs that we're looking at getting involved with as far as some of the uh, competition people we're going to talk about later, Skills USA. Some of you are probably familiar with that. They're kind of a nationwide, uh, the 4-H of all these different skills. But that's one of the things we're looking at is integrating the Part 107 into that for the yeah. And then uh, let's see, we got uh, Doug says, how many times do we expect a Spark or Phantom Pro battery to be able to fully recharge? Um, as I, I you know, there's a couple of questions on batteries in the chat there, and uh, so I, I did answer a little bit, but uh, the, the environment that you're using them, how you're using them, and most importantly, how you're storing them really plays a big part in, uh, in our batteries. Do, you, do we have a battery section that you go over? Yeah, just a little bit. Just, I, I barely just touched touch a little bit. Okay, uh, so, so storage has really been the big thing. When I've been talking to folks out there, uh, and they've been complaining about their battery life. Um, and then I started digging in and asking more details about, about how they're using them, how they're storing them, how they're charging them. Uh, I really found that storage is, has been one of the big ones. Um, now, DJ has nice, they've got the intelligent flight batteries. Those intelligent flight batteries actually have the ability to, after it sits for a number of days, uh, it will actually auto discharge to between 30 and 60% and, and kind of keep it in that range as long as possible. Um, so that, that's great for storage, but, but one of the things that we got to think of is, is how often that happens and how often we're recharging. Um, so you can, you can use that intelligent flight battery and let it sit for three months, four months, and it's, and it's usually pretty good. You can pull it back out, you can charge it back up. Um, but you want to make sure that the battery is not too cold or not too warm. So if you pull the battery right out of the aircraft, right out of the aircraft uh, after you flew it, uh, it, it'd be very warm, and, I, and even some of the DJI chargers will not actually start charging it until its internal temperature sensor has, has gotten into a certain range. Um, when you're not working with DJI batteries or intelligent flight batteries that are well designed, um, you, you can run into a number of issues. Uh, as I showed you with the swelling on the batteries, and the swelling is just kind of a, the first step of what could be an absolute disaster of a battery catching fire around students inside the school, unattended, things like that. Um, so really keeping it in a nice storage range with a, with a, with a comfort, comfortable temperature. And then with the DJI ones, uh, a lot of them actually, and I say this because the Spark and Phantom 4 were mentioned there, um, they actually have a default uh, that is usually somewhere around 10 days when I've gotten them from the factory. So you can actually go into the DJI app and you can choose how soon it discharges. Now you want to weigh how often they're used with how what what limit you put on when it starts to discharge. Uh, for instance, uh, I, I've got a pretty good schedule of, of when I'm going to use certain pieces of equipment and, and how often they get stored rather than used. And uh, so what I'll do is I go through and I change them all for two days, which means it spends less time at a fully charged state uh, than, than it otherwise would. And that seems to really help the life uh, to, to help extend that life quite a bit. Um, that being said, I also uh, it, within my app, I actually set a warning to right about 25% where it starts beeping at me and lets me know, hey, you're at 25% battery. And at that point, I start to recover it. If you drain these batteries too low, uh, they, they don't like that very much either. And, and they're more likely to, uh, to have a shorter life. Um, so I make sure that I'm always landing by about 18% at the lowest. Now, that's my personal preference. I've heard people say 15%, 10%. Uh, but what I found works for me is, you know, at the lowest, uh, I go to about 18%. So I try to keep it between 25 and 18%, um, depending on what I'm doing. And I've got some batteries, uh, as I said in the chat, with, with 300 cycles on them. 
uh, with, with no issue. They're still going strong, uh, still taking a full charge, and critically still able to uh, get right close to what the original rating was for. Uh, what you will notice over time is that the, the original battery rating said it's you know 30 minutes. Uh, well, let's be honest, that first of all, that initial 30 minutes, they say, is with no wind, at a hover, with no payload, uh, because we like to sell stuff that way. Um, but the reality is when you take up the first time and you're actually moving it around, you know, maybe you get, you know, 28 minutes, something like that. And what you can do is you can start tracking that. Uh, we do actually have a flight log that we recommend that, that Tom will talk about later uh, that actually allows you to track batteries as well. Uh, number of cycles, all that fun stuff. And that will really be able to help you uh, when you're doing future planning for, for acquisitions. How many batteries do I need? How many do I go through a year? Are they being properly stored? Uh, really, really documenting that maintenance uh, can, can really help you in the long run with your program and the sustainability issues. So, uh, hopefully that answered your question there. I'll pop back over and check the <laughs> Yeah, I would, especially with these small stem drums we're going to talk about later, you definitely want to have tons of batteries because uh, you don't want to get in the habit of hot swapping your batteries, you pull them right off, putting them right on the charger. And like he said, we emphasize. I like 20%, that's my number, especially for these little guys. You want to start landing your drone, getting the batteries out, because the deeper you drain them, the uh, harder it is on them. And I see Julie and Mike have some questions around administration and insurance. Those will be covered in the next section, so if we want to hold off on those until we get to the next session, uh, I'll probably answer some of your questions, and then uh, if I don't, you can certainly beat me over the head with more. And that's a good point. That's one of the main problems we used to have with our old build drone. It was a kind of a large, clunky drone to try to fly inside. And definitely administrators over the years started not being too happy to see that thing coming into their school. That about it. Um, yep, the, the last two questions I have are all about part one seven there. Okay, and that's what's coming up next. Anything you want to take about a quick five minute break while we transition? Yeah, I'd say give them a five minute break, let them you know, do yeah, we'll you know, water and pressure and all that stuff. We'll um, transition here to the 107. Yeah, we are going to talk about 107, so it is regulations. It is somewhat dry, however, I tried to make it uh, as exciting as possible, so I think uh, we'll at least be somewhat entertaining. We will return at five minutes. The red or the, the